Welcome back to Razmafsa TV. Today, I'm going to interview a very special guest, a very good martial artist from United Kingdom, England, Chris Chatfield. Welcome to Razmafsa TV, Chris. Yeah, brilliant. Lovely to see you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you. It's really an honor for me as well. I remember I uh, saw Chris, it was in Rome. I was waiting in the, I think it was for IMA, if I'm not mistaken. Events. That's right, it was in the airport. We were, had the same the same taxi to the-, to the, yes. to the <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I had heard a lot about Chris back then, watched his videos, and I was really, I always loved the way he moved and so on. I remember when Chris came to me. Oh, you're making me blush. <laughs> no, really. And then Chris came to me and said, which was good for my ego possibly back then. Chris came and said, God, you speak such good English. That was the second sentence after okay. saying hello to me. <laughs> I still remember that. Yes, and it was you. lovely to meet Chris back then. So I'm really happy to have you here, Chris. Very yeah, nice. It's great. it's great to be here. And um, Chris, uh, could you please tell us about your martial arts background? You're a, what I really like about Chris and is that Chris, as far as historical martial arts are concerned, or if I want to call them HEMA, what I like about Chris, Chris comes from a boxing background, the way, for example, I also come from martial arts, or and that's what, what is I love about Chris and his approach to martial arts. I'm going to give the floor to Chris so he explains about his martial arts background. Go ahead, please, Chris. Uh, well, okay, yes, yeah, so I did boxing for many years, kind of from a young man onwards, and just by sheer luck, I answered, I saw an advert in the, in the local paper for uh, a teacher looking, a saber coach, sports saber, looking for students, and I thought I'd try that, why not? And it was a life-changing experience. Uh, the, the gentleman who ran the club was a gentleman called Jeff Elms, who sadly passed away a few years ago. Uh, and he was a very old, old school sabre. Uh, and he just filled me with a passion for fencing. It was one, his approach was wonderful. It was a very old fashioned approach. Many years later, I trained with um, some very good sports fencing, like a British champion up in London. And the first thing he said was, your style is so old, man. And I was really happy. <laughs> I thought, this is great. And he was like, no, you've got to get rid of that. Uh, you know, because he was actually right for for many of the the competitive scene, it didn't work. It was too it was too the actions were too big or too slow, and that kind of really started to put me looking towards a more martial approach to to the sword. Uh, and that's when I started looking at the manuscripts, and eventually ended up founding the Fifty Ninety Five Club in two thousand and two, and we have. Uh, kind of grown from there. We have now seven sales across the world. Wow. Um, yeah, and it's been an adventure. It's, we're continually learning. You know, we're, we're all students. Continually learning. It's continually evolving as we find out more things about it. And um, just keep pressure, pressure testing it, see what happens, see what sticks. We change the weapons all the time, see what we like, see what we don't like. Some people like one thing and they stay, they stay there. Some people like another thing, we move on. We go. Yeah. Um, Chris, very good. Could you first of all tell us about your system? What is your system of fighting based on? Well, the obviously my background was in, uh, uh, I suppose you would call classical saber. So that was my grounding in the use of weapons. And when I started looking at the historical treatises, uh, it was kind of the beginning of 2000. Uh, the one that really stuck to me was um, the work of Vincentio Savioli who was a 16th century Italian who came to England. And one of the reasons why it, I was able to read it was because it was written in English, which uh, there aren't that many manuscripts of the period of that early in English. Um, and it's an extraordinary manuscript. I still think the thing that hooked me probably was as much the philosophy as what he was technically trying to, trying to get across. Um, but it was interesting because it was it was in some ways when you a lot of the other manuscripts you read, uh, you can recognize if you know anything about using a sword in, it, in whatever system you do, you recognize a lot of it. It's the same parries. It's the same. It's the same movement. Uh, there's nothing, you know, nothing. There, there are there, there are idiosyncrasies, but there are nothing extraordinary that you go, wow, that's crazy. Uh, but he was talking about things. And I go, what the hell are you talking about? But I liked his voice and his voice. Is, I thought that that sounds to me like 
somebody who knows what they're talking about. You know, he's, you know, from his anecdotes, it was it was very much a man who had been to war. Um, he was a you know he was a soldier, and so we stuck we stuck with it and went through many many different interpretations depending on what weapon we were using, and to the point where we got what well, I kind of got to the point where this is what I want from it. This is what I've learned from this, whether that's the correct in, uh, the correct interpretation of his work, I don't know. It's impossible to say to some degree. So I kind of see that the I saw I see the kind of the treatises for me is like the middle part of the of the journey. Yeah, it's uh, you know from from finding what you want or what's interesting in the manuscripts is okay. Let's make it work. It's very easy to kind of just create something in a in a kind of vacuum or a bubble. But okay, what what how how would you make this work? Where are the where are the safety valves? You know where are the the checks that you go well. This is right. If I get it wrong, I can get out of it. Yeah. How do I move on? How can I set traps? How can I think? And so we just it's been working 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 on that and enjoying it and having fun with it, which is the main thing as well. Uh, so he's an Italian. Uh, he was an Italian fighter yeah. who served in England. You said. Oh uh, well, he came to England. We've tried to find some as much biography as we can, but not a great deal. We know that he came to England in 1587. Yes. Uh, he came to teach fencing, or possibly to spy, or both. Yeah. Um, uh, and he probably, would, well, according to George Silver, a contemporary of his, he died maybe eight or nine years after arriving. Um, yeah, and we don't really know too much about him. He talks about, yeah, anecdotally, he talks about where he served. He served with the Holy Roman Empire and he fought in Croatia against the Turks. Uh, but that's really all we know about him. Okay. And um, yeah, please tell us about his uh, treaties and or manual or manuscript, we want to call it. What kind of weapons does he teach there? Okay, so he talks about the rapier. Um, you have to define what you mean by that at the time because... Uh, I think if you say rapier to a modern person, you think of a kind of three musketeers, very light, if you think. Um, so we started off using what we what you would call an Elizabethan rapier, which is very long, quite thin, a very civilian weapon. And that was fun for a while. And then we thought, well, you know, it doesn't feel quite right because anecdotally he's talking about the wounds that are happening, which are quite obviously quite heavy cuts. Um, so we we kind of went to the Wallace collection, which is in London, which is a, uh, and thankfully the wonderful creator at the time let us handle as many weapons as we wanted to. And we found one of the, of, of a sword or several swords of the, of the right period uh, and fit to do the job. So we had some replicas made. I have one here. Let's say, okay. okay. So these are very long, probably, yeah, this is what we call like a, what you might call a Saxon hilt, I think they call it. Uh, this is quite broad, very long blade. This is like 40 inch blade. Is it uh, what they call handed. side sword? Is it yeah, what they this... call it side sword. In the museum, they call it a war rapier. It's whatever you eat. Yeah, of course. It's whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, it's a heavy weapon as well. So it's three and a half pound in weight. <sighs> That's heavy. But that kind of fitted with what he was saying in the book about how how much you concentrate on moving the hips and the and the feet which as you know from striking it's all in the hips yeah and that kind of um so it didn't really make sense with a light rapier what he was saying but as soon as you had a weapon with some heft in you know that you can't move with the strength of your arm alone for very long then all of a sudden you'd want you take the weight across your body across your hips and it kind of made sense um yeah so that's what we started with and that was that was really interesting i mean using heavy weapon and a broad bladed weapon like this changes things changes things a lot uh, we learned a lot from this um so yeah as we said we've got seven cells some cells this is their main weapon and i'm a, i'm at heart of sabra so um a lot of the other cells we do saber or cutlass or broadsword and it's been, you know, how can we fit that, you know, what we've learned from, from that treatise 
can we fit that into a, a quicker a quicker system you know into a more um, i say a more nimble system so that that kind of sword i just showed you is, is pretty much like a punching spear really you know that's basically what you're trying to do um and it's been interesting it's good it's um it's been great fun and the sword you showed us it's a double edged just for our viewers uh, this but... one it can be this is a version this is based on a on a example in the Wallace collection called A535. It has two sister swords, which are double-edged. This is what you call a back, back edge. So the back edge ah, is, is flat, uh, but the, the foible is sharp on both edges. Okay. Yeah. Um, but you can find them, you can find them with double edges. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's interesting though, that in the museum, they had three swords and they were exactly the same dimensions. Exactly the same weight. And tell us about these um, uh, three series. It's just that he described, does he show any pictures or he describes it? There thing? are six pictures and they are awful. Um, so it's very verbal. Uh, there, are, there are moments when there are really clear descriptions. He, like he talks about where your shoulders are, where your hips are, where your feet are, really clear where your hands are. And then as he goes on, it becomes more and more your guess is as good as mine because it's so open. The reason for, I think, and the reason you have to remember is, especially in that period, most of these manuscripts are memory aids for students who have been taught yes. by that person. Yes. Um, so you have to be very careful that, um, to misquote Frank Zappa, and who doesn't, um, you know, writing about fencing is like tap dancing about architecture. It's really hard, you know, how do you do it? So you've got to be careful how you, how you approach it. And he's looking, you, I think, I think it's very difficult the further back you go to create, recreate a lost system. It's, uh, you know, it's nothing. It's very difficult to do. So what can you do? You can look at the questions that they ask, because they're good questions, because the times they were living in were harder times than the times we live in. What are the questions they're asking? What are their solutions? And how are they getting there? And with, the, with the clues they're giving you, can you piece that together? And does that make martial sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I fully agree with you. Even, even when the manuscripts are full of pictures and drawings, it doesn't mean anything. I fully agree with you. Well, you can, you can interpret that and everybody will come to, to a manuscript with their own, their own history. You know, so if with your background, we can look at the same picture. You might see something different but the same picture, you will interpret it differently from me because, and who's say who's right or wrong? Yes, absolutely. But, um, you know, we all have ways that we can understand things because that's how we've, we've experienced them. Okay. And uh, before we go ahead, so uh, he uses a war rapier or side sword. He well, he, he calls it a rapier. Rapier. But the only thing he says about it is it has a, it has uh, two edges on a point. Okay. That's the only thing. Um, it gives a clue that it's a rakasa hilt, so you're holding it with a hook grip, uh, with a forefinger over. Um, interesting, you could, I've got a theory, which is probably a bit crazy, but maybe at that time, the idea of rapier was actually, it was different from a sword, not because of its function, but because of how you held it. So George Silver says, complains that the Italians say that the English can't thrust properly because they can't reach over with their finger. Um, and it might be, this is just a, this is a pure, a wild guess, that it might be a nickname of, uh, of, uh, to rapier is to seize in Latin. It might just be a nickname of how you hold a sword. Don't know, you know, because by throwing a finger over the, over the quillum, it gives you a different mechanic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah. And does he also talk about other types of weapons or only in this weapon? So he talks, uh, his sword and sword and dagger. Oh, sword and dagger. Yeah, but what he says is, uh, quite interesting, he says there's a line in it that, where he says that learning the sword is the foundation for all other martial arts, as he sees them. Um, yeah. Interesting. So we've explored that. I mean, we've applied it, we've tried to apply this, some of his techniques to boxing. It's, yeah, it's, it's, interesting. <laughs> it's good, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, it's funny. Some of it works, some of it doesn't work. And again, it depends who's doing it. Some people can make it work, some people can't make it work. Interesting. 
Reminds me of a Filipino martial arts who start with weapon, then they go to empty handed. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It is well, I always say to I always say used to say to my friends years ago, you know, boxers should fence and fencers should box because they're sister sports. You know, one is you know as far as I can see, boxing is unarmed fencing. Very interesting. And uh, you, did I understand you correctly? So he was Italian, but wrote it originally in English? Did I understand you well, correctly? Well, he came to it probably, we think it was put into English by a gentleman called John Florio, who was uh, the son of an Italian re uh, Protestant refugee who came to England. Uh, and he specialised in bringing Italian texts to England and translating them. Um, and it's pretty much the first, it's in two books. The first book is Marshall. One, uh, it's on sword, single sword and then sword and dagger. The second book is pretty much a legal thing about the, le the legal ramifications of, of, of dueling, uh, which is probably a translation from another work, but there are anecdotes in there, which are obviously his personal anecdotes. Um, yeah, so I would think unlikely that he wrote it, but it maybe he, he uh, it was ghostwritten for him, I think. We can say okay of course yeah yes and um does he talk about okay you said about that the foundation is uh, this to, bo to boxing okay does he also talk about grappling in this manuscript very lightly not much there's no there's no actual what you would say uh, uh he mentions wrestling and it, there are certainly um you're doing body to body action sometimes so there's some trips there's some throws um, but again, it's a long weapon, so you want to keep distance mainly with, with that kind of weapon. Okay. Um, and uh, does he talk about any pole arms in this treatise? No, he doesn't. Though we've tried it, we've tried his system with pole arms, and that's one. Yeah. See, I mean, it's it's, a, it's um, what it boils down. To, what I think. What what I've taken away from it. I'm not. I'm not going to say that this is the definitive interpretation of it by any means, because you could interpret it so many ways, is, and what I think has become more and more my uh, passion for the club, within the club, is the exploration of the body. You know, it all begins with the body. And, you know, if you move your body in a certain way, if you move your feet in a certain way, if you align the hips in a certain way, then you just have to adjust yourself to the idiosyncrasy of the weapon or not weapon. Um, I think, I'm not, you know, I think I prefer to have one system that you adapt to lots of weapons rather than lots of systems that you adapt to different weapons. And that's too confusing for people. Um, I think if you, you know, as you know this, combat's combat. You know, we said it works or it doesn't work. And if you, and if you, if you look at the most effective forms, really, they're always generally simple. Yes. Uh, if you have too many techniques going in your head, it's not going to come naturally to you until you step back and you, you do create, you know, if when you get to a certain, maybe a certain level of where you can start, you're setting traps and you, that's when the kind of the, the depth of technique might come in. But the foundations will never be that different. They're just variations on a, on a theme. I fully so, agree with you. So what we've been doing is, is, you know, somebody will come along and say, should we try it with sword and shield? Yeah. Okay. Well, what, okay, what will we do? Okay, well, we know that this works because this is basic. This is basic combat with these kind of weapons. What is it that we can put in there that works? And does it work? Does it not work? You know, how you adjust it? And generally speaking, it's been, it's been very successful. Um, could you please, okay, I, I would like to ask you, what type of weapons do you teach in your saw, in your school? So uh, in the Brighton saw at the moment, uh, which is what, obviously what I'm most heavily involved with. We uh, do a lot of cutlass because I like cutlass because that's fun. And we do a lot of, uh, we start doing a lot of broadsword, so something like this, which is a basket hilted. Now, is it is like basically. English basket hilt? It's, yeah, well, this is actually, this is a Scottish hilt, but yeah. they're pretty much the same. This, you know, don't let anybody Scottish hear that, but um, yeah, so these are very interesting. Um, that makes a lot of sense for me. Yes. Um, uh, this is um, this is designed for fencing, so this is a very flexible blade, yeah. which means obviously with the heavier blade you have to be very very careful when you spar with people. Of course, this is you can be a bit more dynamic. Yeah, 
um, which is good. You know, I think you need uh, you need a mixture of both. Yes. Um, but uh, different clubs. So some, some clubs, again, the London club specializes in the in the heavy rapier. Um, and other clubs are doing saber, cutlass. It's all pretty much the same. They're, they're all cut and thrust, single handed cut and thrust weapons. Um, and what about longsword? Do you teach longsword? No. Um, no, we do staff. I think for me, I mean, if I was nothing against longsword, so if that's a, a whole other world. Um, we do staff, quarter staff, which I think is probably similar ish in the fact that you have both hands when you're moving, you know. Uh, so that's my that's my two handed weapon. Why don't you teach long sword? Or <laughs> excuse me if I may ask. Uh, so what no, is it's a good question. You know what? I don't know. Um, it's not something that's ever really appealed to me. Um, you know, I, I, I know some great fine long sworders, um, but it's yeah, it's just I don't know. Um, I, I you know I think maybe. I started off as a sports brewer, and that's that's. <laughs> I like the cut and thrust single single handed sword. It's it's just, yeah. Okay, okay, and uh, so this is the.